It is a matter that will be borne in mind not simply by the Scottish Prison Service, but also by the Scottish Court Service, who ultimately would have to engage and deal with matters. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Excellent. And you know, we're always delighted when the First Minister keeps his eye on the ball. <laughs> presiding Officer. <laughs> presiding Officer. <laughs> presiding Officer. The Scottish Government has missed its 18 week waiting time target from referral to treatment. It still, month after month, fails to hit its target of treating A and E patients within four hours, even after diluting the target. And bed blocking, which means people left languishing in beds because the care system has nowhere for them to go, has gone up 300%. The NHS is now going backwards on his watch. Can the First Minister remind us why does he still have confidence in his Health Secretary, Alex Neil? First Minister. Well, the, uh, Jan Lamont started off by saying we're always delighted. Uh, somehow the phrase delighted in Jan Lamont doesn't square at uh, First Minister's <laughs> questions. Uh, but the NHS, uh, and all of us should agree, uh, is facing substantial challenge. Uh, it's treating many more patients. Uh, and all of us agree, I think, that the people who work in the NHS uh, are doing a tremendous job uh, for Scotland. Uh, we always want to, to do better, uh, and a lot of the statistics they need to be improved. That's what we intend to do. But I think we should just remember two things. Uh, firstly, that the satisfaction levels with the NHS in Scotland, according to the patients, the people who experience treatment in the NHS, are a very, very high level indeed. Uh, and secondly, if we compare the statistics which were released this week with what was happening when Joanne Lamont was a minister, uh, then we can see very substantial improvement. And since she mentioned accident emergency in particular, can I remind the Labour benches that Andy Kerr, then the health minister, was delighted with a performance of 87 per cent in the health service. The figures that Joanne Lamont are complaining about are now 93 per cent. Yes, substantial room for improvement, but it does seem passing strange that the Labour Party were delighted with 87 per cent when they're in office, but condemn 93 per cent when the SNP is in office. Joanne Lamont. Can I promise the First Minister I will be delighted when he stops displaying such disgraceful complacency yeah. about what's happening in the NHS? Because it's patients and others who are expressing concerns, not simply politicians. It would appear that although the First Minister says he's reflecting on these statistics, he actually doesn't believe them because they show the NHS under his watch is failing. Will he listen then to the professionals? To the professionals. Dr Clifford Mann, President of the College of Emergency Medicine, said, and I quote, the College has been warning for some time now about extreme pressure in the unscheduled healthcare system. These are most evident in the A&E departments and create sometimes overwhelming challenges. The British Medical Association Scotland said, while the government is painting a picture of a well-staffed NHS, the reality is that doctors are working under extreme pressure and work workforce shortages and high vacancy rates are significant contributing factors to this. Last week, we found that only 67 people in this chamber had confidence in his health secretary. Isn't it the case? They might be the only 67 people in this country who trust him on health. Yeah. First Minister. Well, uh I regard uh, with uh, great interest uh, the comments uh, of uh, health professionals, wherever they, they come from. But when we're looking at emergency medicine, then surely the key comment we should consider are those of Dr Jason Long, who is chair of the College of Emergency Medicine in Scotland. Uh, and he has said on the 28th of May, uh, which is this year, uh, so this is a very current quote, the College continues to support the Scottish Government's investment and commitment to the specialty of emergency medicine and the work of emergency departments in Scotland. There is a substantial body of opinion which indicates, and let me quote Dr Martin McKechnie, the Vice Chair of the College of Emergency Medicine, 
We have had a lot of support and investment in the last 18 months from the Government, and we are beginning, I hope, to feel and see the effects of some of those changes. Now, these are medical professionals at the front end of accident and emergency who are commenting on the emergency care plan implemented by the Health Secretary, which has brought about an improvement to 93.3 in the latest accident and emergency statistics. That is to say, the people who are treated within four hours. John Lamont said I was complacent about these things. In the first part of my answer, I dealt in some measure with saying that we are seeing and looking to improve these statistics further. That is our aim and intention in the health service. But I think it is fair to reflect, comparing that 93.3 per cent, the latest figure for March 2014, that in April 2006, a performance of 87.5 per cent was hailed by the then Health Minister Andy Kerr as, quote, shows that the vast majority of accident emergency departments are meeting the four-hour target. Investment and reform in the National Health Service is paying off. Now, I would suggest, if we're looking for complacency, then the government of which Joanne Lamont was a member was complacent in 2006, whereas this Health Secretary is putting in the investment to improve things in 2014. Joanne Lamont. Maybe we should remind the First Minister that it took an elderly man to have his photograph on the front page of the Daily Record waiting on a trolley before the emergency plan was put in place. The fact of the matter is, and we have evidence again, the First Minister will quote people who agree with him. He does not listen to people who are telling them there are real problems. Because the First Minister can trade statistics and alibis and talk about the past. He does not seem to realise he doesn't seem to realise this is about real people. And I shall, I shall, in confidence, supply him with the details of a patient whose partner wrote to us and wants her experience to be known, but wishes to remain anonymous. Let's call her Mary. She went to her GP with a lump on her breast. Her GP referred her as a priority to the Royal Alexandra Hospital for cancer screening. No appointment came. In pain with the lump growing, she went to the accident and emergency unit only to be told she couldn't be treated because she was on a pathway, or rather, waiting for an appointment. She didn't get an appointment within the government target and, after weeks of worrying, was forced to pay for private health care as the lump grew. That is a distressing reality of what missing targets means for patients. So can the First Minister tell Mary and all the real people who make up the statistics that he is trying to play down. Why should they have confidence in his NHS? First Minister. A any case uh, that, that's referred to me or to the health sector will be treated seriously. Uh, and no one has ever claimed that every patient receives ideal treatment from our National Health Service or indeed any National Health Service. But our National Health Service in Scotland is something still of which we can be really, really proud. And if we want to look at patient experience, then we should also consider the balance of the patient opinion website, where patient after patient reflects on the excellent treatment they have received from our National Health Service. A very important innovation in my estimation, uh, because in the nature of, uh, of uh, human affairs, then it's often where people have failed and the National Health Service has failed to deliver excellence of treatment that come to public attention. Therefore, I do think it's important that the patient opinion website gives the balance of opinion of the many hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens who year on year receive excellent treatment from our National Health Service. Now, Joanne Lamont complains when, when I reflect that the statistics that we are seeing now, although not ideal, and in some cases still to, to meet the, the targets to which we aspire, in every single case are superior to those when the Labour Party left office in 2007. And what the Labour Party said in 2007, quote from the manifesto, health care across Scotland has never been better. Waiting times are the lowest ever, despite a big increase in operations. Well, we've had more big increases in operations and attendances since, and waiting times are better than when the Labour Party left office. So the central position in political terms that the Labour Party has to answer is why were they patting themselves in the back when they were in office, then attack the SNP now when every single part of the health service is performing to higher standards?
like the First Minister, of course we recognise the good things that are happening in the NHS and we celebrate them. But the problem with the First Minister, he wants to ignore the problems that are emerging yeah. rather than tackling them. Because we want to make progress, we want to get better. Under the, uh, his watch, we are going backwards. The First Minister says he is not complacent. <clears throat> the First Minister says he is not complacent. Yet he ignores his own statistics and failed targets. He ignores the first-hand views of the experts and professionals. And most damningly, he ignores the lived reality of patients in Scotland. The First Minister is in denial about the pressures on the NHS on his watch and the failures in patient care. The fact is, he is more at home in the imagined world after a yes vote rather than the real world of life under the SNP government. So, for those waiting in A&E, for those waiting for treatment, for those waiting in pain, will the First Minister admit he's failing to manage our NHS and go on with the day job that patients across Scotland so desperately need him to do? First well, Minister. Uh, as I pointed out, and I could go on to inpatient waits, outpatient waits, referral to treatment waits, as well as accident and emergency. On every single one of these measures, on the watch of this government, treatment in the National Health Service has improved. And Joanne Lamont, when she says things are getting worse, they are better, much better, in every single one of these statistics than they were when the Labour Party were in office. And Joanne Lamont was a government minister. Now, let me tell you what has happened to the National National Health Service in this watch. National Health Service staff, despite the cutbacks from Westminster, have increased, uh, increased under the SNP, staffing up by 6.7%. We have protected in real terms the frontline NHS budget, something that the Labour Party Britain pledged to do in Scotland and haven't done in Wales. Patient satisfaction, real people. Real people in the National Health Service, 87% of patients are satisfied with local health service, up 7% in the watch of the SNP. Cleaner hospitals, C. diff in patients aged over 65, reduced by 83.8%. Remember when Jackie Bailey said we were going to be the health uh, infection centre of the world and then discovered she was talking about what happened under the Labour government? <laughs> and abolishing cost and prescription charges in the National Health Service from April 2011, aspiring to the original foundation principles that the health service is available to all, regardless of income. All of these things have happened under the SNP. A health service, a national health service, a public service for all, protected by the SNP, neglected by Labour in Wales, and every single one of these statistics better than when Joanne Lamont was in office. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no plans, near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Yesterday morning, John Swinney was asked 11 times what the set-up costs of an independent Scotland would be, and he was unable to answer. Within three hours, the First Minister conjured up a figure of 250 to 300 million pounds. So can the First Minister break down that figure for us today, by department, so we can see exactly how that number was reached? First Minister. Well, the, the £200 million uh, figure uh, I quoted, of course, came from Professor Dunleavy exactly. of, the, <laughs> of the London School of Economics. Uh, now, why he came into the press conference yesterday uh, was because, of course, he was cited over the weekend uh, by... Uh, uh, Ruth Davidson's colleagues in the United Kingdom government as the expert who could estimate the set-up costs that we would be likely to face when we establish the departments of uh, independent Scotland. And the figure £2.7 billion was cited by the UK government. Unfortunately, Professor Dunleavy found out that his name was being taken in vain and embarked on a series of comments describing the £2.7 billion figure as bizarrely inaccurate, accusing the Treasury of badly misrepresenting LSE research, equating that appears to take minimum Whitehall reorganisation and multiply by 180 agencies, overstating by 12 times. He says that the Treasury figures are bizarrely 
inaccurate and then made an estimate of the cost to £200 million for the set-up cost. So all I would say to Ruth Davidson, apart from the basic unwisdom of introducing <laughs> Professor Dunleavy <laughs> into this question time, if the chosen expert of the United Kingdom government comes up with an estimate and I describe it as reasonable, isn't that a way to go forward, as opposed to misrepresenting his work, overstating it by 12 times and attempting to traduce the reputation of the London School of Economics. <laughs> Ruth Davidson. The First Ms. Minister Davidson. wants to talk about Professor Dunleavy. So let's talk about Professor Dunleavy, because he wrote a blog yesterday, and I have it here. He says that the Financial Times asked him about set-ups costs, which he gave, in his own words, a guesstimate, which, again, in his own words, only covers Whitehall reorganisations and not whole-scale new policy systems. So, I think the First Minister would be in much stronger territory challenging the Treasury's figures if he could come up with his own. We've got 100 days to go, and the SNP's case seems seriously to be resting on a guesstimate by a professor responding to a press inquiry. Order! Order! Order, let us hear Ms Davidson. I find it worrying that the First Minister has no intention, no intention of telling the people of Scotland how his paperclip economics add up. <laughs> because the fact, is, the fact is, he should have the numbers. Because two years ago, the Finance Secretary said that he would set out detailed set-up costs. Let me quote, let me quote from paragraph 49. Work is currently underway in finance and the office of the Chief Economic Advisor to build a comprehensive overview of the institutions, the costs and the staff numbers, which I will draw together and provide an update to Cabinet on in June. That's June 2012. So taxpayer-funded civil servants were working on giving the government those costs more than two years ago. The Cabinet has the numbers. The First Minister has the numbers. Why won't he let Scotland see the numbers? First Minister. This uh, is uh, the Scotland analysis, the most comprehensive piece of work that the United Kingdom Treasury apparently has ever produced. Professor Dunleavy, who Danny Alexander yesterday Order. tried to write our history, he appears in page 38. It says the Institute of Government, the London School of Economics and Political Science, estimated the average cost for a new policy department at approximately £15 million. If costs were incurred for all 180 organisations, the total cost would be £2.7 billion. It was the UK Government who introduced Professor Dunleavy, who I must say is an estimable person. I've never met him, but he sounds like the sort of person I want to meet. Now, it was Professor Dunleavy who said that the UK government were guilty of gross exaggeration, were multiplying his work by a factor of 12, and then produced the estimate of £200 million as closer to the mark. Now, Annie Alexander, when faced with this torrent of questioning as to why they were relying on a professor who was saying they were badly misrepresenting his work, said, no, no, we're not talking about Professor Dunleavy. It was actually... Professor Young that we were relying on. But then Professor Young told the Financial Times, however, the £1.5 billion estimate was not his, but extrapolated from another range of estimates. And then looking at his paper, Professor Young said, the UK position is to make Order. pessimistic predictions, warnings and the occasional threat. <laughs> Professor Young is somebody I want to meet as well. <laughs> So basically, Ruth Davidson, when the two professors relied upon by the United Kingdom Treasury to produce the ammunition to destroy the case for Scottish independence, end up backing the case in terms of the estimates they produce, I think it's time to revise her questioning strategy. Question three. Will it ready? Order. Mr Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Will there any... <laughs> we were told 
we were told that the white paper was the most comprehensive and detailed blueprint of its kind ever published. Comprehensive and detailed, but it doesn't even include the costs of getting started. The Scottish... This is... Order, let us hear Mr Rennie, please. Order! Come on, behave. The Scottish Government's transition cost document that Ruth Davidson rightly referred to, but he refused to answer, was written two years ago. <coughs> Will the First Minister tell us where it is? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I would say that they... <laughs> The, the depth of examination of the questioning and the combination of Better Together it leaves a, a whole range of opportunities uh, for answer. Yes, the documents we published yesterday have comprehensive information. Yes, the documents we published yesterday make a range of forecasts and estimates. But the difference between the document that his law published yesterday and the document published by the Scottish Government is the Hislot's document has been destroyed by the very experts who were cited to support it. And the other difference is this, the Scottish Government looks forward in a way to the developing the Scottish economy and Scottish society. We don't claim the Westminster bonus of the UK Government, which nobody in Scotland believes they'll ever see from the United Kingdom Treasury. What we say is working together we can achieve higher employment, higher productivity, a better balance of working population in Scotland, and matching and marrying the resources and talents of our people, build a more prosperous and just society. And if Willie Rennie thinks their miserable, destroyed document that Danny Alexander presented yesterday is going to match up to a positive vision of the future, then he's going to get the same disappointment in September as he experienced last week. Willie Rennie. The, the answer to where is it was very long, but did not answer the question. <laughs> this is important for the First Minister, because if people vote for independence in September, then find out that the First Minister was wrong on the costs, there is no way back. If there is work, if there is work, and he scoffs, but he needs to answer the question, if there is work, why won't he show it? If there isn't, why hasn't it been done? We know that he's an expert on everyone else's figures, so he now has the chance to put them right. It's simple. He can publish the document that was produced two years ago and sets out the costs for the transition to an independent Scotland. Will he agree to do that today? First Minister. I think if Willie Rennie cares to examine the, the, the document published yesterday, he'll say projections not for 2016-17, not just for the two years following, but a 15-year projection for growth and achievement in the Scottish economy. Specifically, it looks forward to a 0.3 increase in productivity. It looks forward to a better balance of the working age population. It looks forward to increasing employment in Scotland by 3.5% and sets out the mechanisms and measures by which, using the powers and tools of independence, then we can achieve that. And if we manage that together as a society, then that does mean that we'll have an extra £5 billion additional tax revenue, £1,000 ahead for every man, woman and child in Scotland, or £2,000 per family. Not given to us in a plate, but something we can work together as a society so as we can create a better, a more prosperous and fairer future for the people of Scotland. Question four, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that the Royal Mail has called into question its ability to fulfil the universal service obligation and what the impact could be on rural communities. First Minister. Well, postal services are a lifeline for many of Scotland's communities, particularly in some of our nation's more remote rural areas. Those communities depend on the delivery service guaranteed by the Royal Mail's universal service obligation. Why it's so deeply concerning 
uh, to see the Royal Mail concerns about its ability to fulfil the universal service obligation. Uh, I think we can reflect on two things. One, it's disgraceful that this public asset was sold at knockdown price. Uh, and secondly, with regulation of mail will be in the hands of a Scottish Parliament, which will provide us with the opportunity to ensure that that universal postal service is there in the best interests of communities across this country. Dave Thompson. I would thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, prior to the cut price sell-off, we were given specific assurances that the universal service obligation would be maintained. Indeed, as recently as last month, Vince Cable said, and I quote, the sale of shares in Royal Mail has delivered an hour com on our commitment to protect the universal postal service and safeguard vital services for the taxpayer. My local MP, Danny Alexander, also once said... Can we get a we, question, Mr Thompson? Yes, presiding officer. We must continue to be vigilant and safeguard the USO at all costs. Does the First Minister believe that these Lib Dem MPs are to be trusted? First Minister... Well, I think the question of trust between Danny Alexander and Vince Cable was very pertinent to the events of the last, the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, and I think it's something that no doubt will be speculated on. I mean, who commissioned the poll at Inverness, Nairn and Loch Arbor? Did Vince Nable know about it? The only thing that's certain is we know what the results of that poll were at Inverness, Nairn and Loch Arbor. I believe that this undermining or questioning, let's call it that, because it's a questioning, a concern, which has been said by Royal Mail executives about the universal service obligation, brings very quickly into the front line of public discussion something that those of us who oppose the privatisation of the Royal Mail were deeply concerned about. And we will be looking for more assurances that this universal service obligation guarantee still stands. Whether we get them from Danny Alexander, whether we get them from Vince Cable, I suspect we should get them quickly, otherwise we might not get them at all. Question five, Claire Baker. Sorry. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recommendations in the Land Reform Review Group's final report, The Land of Scotland and the Common Good. First Minister. Well, it's very important that the Scottish Government and this Parliament uh, and all stakeholders have time to consider what is a very substantial report. We have already announced that we agree with the importance of assuring who, now, who owns Scotland, and last weekend we announced the timetable for completing the land register. Uh, as uh, Claire Baker will be aware, the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee are taking evidence from the review group and stakeholders this week and next. Thereafter, the Environment Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, will provide further detail on how we intend to take forward Scotland's land reform agenda at the Community Land Scotland Conference being held in Skye on June 7. Um, I thank the First Minister for that reply. Um, will he today support the report's direction of travel and rise to its challenges, the vast majority of which can be met in this Parliament? And will he be prepared to make quick progress where possible? The Minister's U-turn on Sunday in terms of a timescale for the land registration completion was welcome. Does he recognise that one of the key calls uh, from the review group is for greater transparency over ownership? And will the government now introduce the regulations that will ensure the land register will contain details of beneficial ownership and disclose the true owner of a foreign company? First Minister. Well, the, 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 the land register is very important, and therefore the timetable for completing it, I, I'm glad, is, I think, welcomed by, uh, by Claire Baker. If she asks if we are supporting the direction of travel. The answer to that question is yes. Not every specific proposal. As she knows, for example, we don't agree with the derating of agricultural land uh, being questioned because we've already investigated that. But the direction of travel is a good way to put it. And I look forward to the uh, examination that is going to come from this Parliament. I was disappointed uh, that Claire Baker rather misrepresented, or perhaps it was her press officer, what the, uh, what the report said when she suggested that there had not been substantial action from the SNP since we came to power in 2007, the report actually said that since 2003 there has been no land reform programme, since 2003. What there has been, of course, is a re-establishment of the Community Land Fund, which was effectively abolished by the Labour Party, which is quite important if you want communities to buy land that they have a, a fund to support. So I am sure that the member will today Claire Baker says it's nonsense. I'm afraid it's not nonsense. If she looks into the details, she'll see that there was no fund to enable communities to buy land until it was re-established by this government. Now, I'm sure, therefore, that Claire Baker will be first to welcome 
Today's announcement that the Scottish Government's land fund, re-established by the Scottish National Party, is supporting the community ownership of the Carloway estate on Lewis with a grant of over £200,000. This will enable the purchase of 11,000 acres of land, including the renowned Callanish Standing Stones, to come into community ownership, another important stepping stone into our target of a million acres under community ownership by 2020. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Thank you. Like others, I welcome the agreement for a target date for completion of the register. And I, I wonder if the, the Government now regrets voting against my amendments to the Land Registration uh, Bill, which would have done just that. But why can the Government accept that recommendation and reject so out of hand the key recommendations on tax so quickly without leaving any time for scrutiny of the report itself? First Minister. Well, we, we are considering uh, the variety of aspects of the report. The area, for example, that I mentioned on uh, uh, the rating of agricultural land is something that we had already investigated as a government and reported on uh, in the last year or so, and that's why we pointed that out in reaction. But in terms of the direction of travel of the report, we are extremely interested, which is why I've set out the parliamentary and ministerial timetable for responding to the substantive suggestions in the report. So I welcome Patrick Harvey's acknowledgement of the importance of the land register. And I'm sure he, like me, is enthused by the reinvigorated land purchase fund for communities, which is taking us on the way to that enormous, but I think achievable target of a million acres in community ownership by 2020. Question six, Gavin Brown. Presenting officer, to ask the First Minister when the business rates incentivisation scheme will become operational. First Minister. Well, as Gam Brown knows, it was introduced on the 1st of April 2012. The Scottish Government, in general terms, offers the most competitive business rates package in the United Kingdom, and as he also knows, supporting 90,000 businesses through the Small Business Bonus Scheme. It became operational in 2012. Apparently, that's an interesting definition of operational. In year one, the targets were changed mid-year, and nobody has been paid. In year two, no targets were set at all, and we are now in year three, and no targets have been set for year three. Can the First Minister name a single council that has been incentivised by this scheme? First Minister. Well, as Gavin Brown, I am sure, would, uh, would want to acknowledge that COSLA well, OK, I'm not sure he wants to acknowledge it, but he's going to hear it anyway. The COSLA leaders decided in May 2013 that they did not want to consider reviewing the 2012-13 price targets until the final non-domestic rates audited figures for 2012-13 became available in February of this year. That was a view and decision of the COSLA leadership. They reconsidered their position in the 25th of April 2014 meeting that a significant event had not occurred, and as a result, they were unable to agree the revised 2012-13 targets. I understand that was by a majority of 17 to 15 uh, on the COSLA leadership. Mr Swinney will be meeting with COSLA in friendship and in cooperation and trying to see if we can agree a way forward because this scheme was brought in to incentivise local authorities and therefore we wish to see agreement on how the incentive is dispersed. But I would say in all honesty to Gavin Brown, if he likes to look into the detail, I know that he, because he is such a careful scrutiner of public money, will want to see an incentive scheme paid out for business innovation, not just paid out because there has been a lack of success of appeals against the rating system. Because the Tory party, whatever else they are known for, and Gavin Brown, whatever else he does or does not do, is a man who looks at the detail and the facts, and therefore I am sure will want to back Mr Swinney's efforts to take this scheme forward in a proper way. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business, members who are leaving the chambers, who do so quickly and quietly.